What I want to talk about this morning is an idea. I've talked about it in a couple of places. Uh, some of you may have heard it before. I think it bears repeating. It's a much more serious idea than what I put out yesterday, which had a note of uh, whimsy in its genesis. This idea is important, whatever that means, because it would change uh, not only the area of its concern, but our view of the world generally. And Easter is an appropriate time to discuss this because it concerns the genesis of man, of consciousness and self-reflection, which is what the Easter mythologium is uh, also an expression of. So what I wanted to talk about this morning is a new notion of how human evolution occurred and what the critical factors were in it and how to draw a uh, picture for us that shows how our intellectual complexity and symbol manipulating facilities could have emerged naturally from a background of animal existence and over a fairly rapid period of time. Over the last uh, three to five million years, actually, the African continent has been growing more dry and has experienced fluctuations of aridity. Nevertheless, as recently as uh, 2,000 years ago, the Roman historian Pliny called North Africa the breadbasket of Rome because wheat was being grown over thousands and thousands of acres. Now, it's in this same area <clears throat> of northern Africa, the Great Rift Zone, the Serengeti Plain, where physical anthropologists place the origin of human beings. And it has to do with the following sequence of events. Uh, arboreal primates living in an unbroken re continental rainforest ecology achieve a uh, close adaptation to existence in the canopy. And this is stabilized for millions of years. They are insectivores. They have the opposable thumb and binocular or uh, rudimentary binocular vision. The drying up of the African continent caused the breakdown of this continental rainforest into a configuration of patches of forest with uh, grassland in between. And in this grassland ecology, uh, herds of mammals evolved, proto-cattle, proto-bison, exotic mammals like giraffes and uh, gazelles of all types. At the same time, the primate adaptation to this increasing aridity was to begin to descend from the trees and to hunt in packs and to shift from a diet of uh, canopy fruits and berries and roots dug from the ground to an omnivorous diet that could include meat. So in this situation, these uh, tribal monkeys developed a complicated repertoire of signals to aid in pack hunting in exactly the same way that wolves are known to do. Now, into this situation there and their habit was nomadic and to follow behind these great herds either killing the animals that were uh, less well and could be killed by the crude means at their disposal or living off <clears throat> the kills of other carnivores and this is still the habit of uh, baboons now into this situation comes a mushroom which grows in the manure of the ungulate animals that have evolved on this plane. 
And in this protein-intensive environment where there is pressure on the availability of protein, these foraging primates are testing every object in the environment for its food value. So, uh, Roland Fisher, who was a researcher into the effect of psychedelic drugs and the structure of consciousness, showed that small doses of psilocybin, sub-psychedelic, uh, sub-threshold doses of psilocybin, actually increase visual acuity. And he had a very elegant experiment where two parallel lines could be deformed by turning a dial, and you would put graduate students in front of this, stoned and unstoned, and ask them to press a buzzer when the lines appeared to them to no longer be parallel. And he showed that consistently uh, a small amount of psilocybin allowed you to detect this change uh, sooner than an ordinary subject was able to. And he said to me, he said, you see, this proves that in some cases drugs give you a clearer picture of reality than their absence. And what it means is that these primates who were inculcating the mushroom into their diet were gaining a subtle adaptive advantage over their fellows who were avoiding the mushroom because they were gaining in visual acuity, which is one of the critical parameters that a uh, pack-hunting carnivore would be subject to in that kind of an environment. So, uh, without any teleology being involved, without any invocation of an extraterrestrial intelligence, we see that a feedback loop was established in the food chain of these primates very early on. Those who ate the mushroom tended to survive and outbreed those who did not. At the same time, the relationship between these animals and these herd ungulate mammals was shifting from a hunting situation to a situation of domestication, which was bringing the mushroom ever more into the fore. And if you look back uh, at the archaeological evidence in North Africa, especially the paintings, the uh, late Neolithic paintings on the Tassili Plateau in southern Algeria, you see there magnificently portrayed herds of cattle and, and new, I mean, beautifully uh, painted, more, more sensitively portrayed cattle than you find at Altamira and Lascaux. And you see also shamans dancing with mushrooms sprouting out of their body and with mushrooms clutched in their hands, groups of them running, holding them on high with geometric uh, matrices of connected dots all around them. And uh, now, of course, in that area, it's very similar to this. It's an area of sculpted sandstone and uh, cross-cut arroyos with undercut cliffs. And it's very dry, but in some places the Neolithic detritus is several meters deep. And the people who lived in the Tesseli Plateau when the aridity of the Sahara further increased, are the people who migrated east to the valley of the Nile and established the proto-Egyptian civilization of six to 10,000 years ago. The important point I want to make about this later phase of the uh, human involvement with the mushroom was that it was always intimately connected with cattle and the goddess religions of ancient North Africa and the Middle East are, are uh, religions of cattle goddesses. And this connection between the cow and the mother goddess and the mushroom is some kind of uh, key to understanding the evolution of, of uh, religious sensitivity in early man in that part of the Middle East. It carries forward into uh, historical time with the mysteries at Eleusis, where there is a, uh, 
a clear indication that a psychedelic substance was being used, either ergotized rye or uh, a mushroom of some sort. And this, uh, this notion that uh, it was the presence of the mushroom on the African veldt at a critical uh, bifurcation of primate evolution that created uh, the feedback loop which eventually developed into self-reflecting consciousness. Because you see, at lower doses, the psilocybin is giving increased visual acuity and it seems like increased symbol processing ability, its strange effect on the language centers. But of course, inevitably, they would have also discovered its higher dose effects, which would be to convey them into an inner tremendum that became then the cultural guiding image. In other words, it, it was perceived as, as a god, as a goddess, as the goddess, and became then the arrow for cultural dynamics and evolution. And the reason I think this is important is because uh, the spin-off implications of the acceptance of an idea like this would bring us into much greater harmony with our environment. We sort of have the anxiety of an orphan about our origins because our best people in physical anthropology don't give very good accounts, can't seem to make sense of how we could have been forced out and emerged out of primate organization. And so there's been much talk in the 20th century about the search for the missing link, which was always conceived of as a physical skeleton of a certain kind of intermediate hominoid form. But it isn't a missing link, I think. It's a missing factor. And the factor which accelerated the forward evolution of the brain size of uh, this uh, particular primate line was the inclusion of psychedelic plants in the diet, which then fed the tendency towards symbol formation and self-reflection. If this idea gained wide acceptance, uh, some of our laws and some of our ways of relating to nature and to medicine plants in particular would uh, have to be altered and brought into line. This is the source of our humanness. Apparently, the, the psychoactive compounds being elaborated by plants throughout nature are regulators of various forms of evolution in animals. And food chains and all this, which uh, appear very trivial on the surface, are actually the message-bearing uh, medium of the, of the hand of God, which is forming and sculpting nature along these various creodes of development. And uh, the... the uh, the thing to understand about this or why this has impact in the future is because it's a continuous process which we can foster and husband uh, and help develop in healthy ways if we recognize that it's going on. I mentioned Eleusis as, uh, as, a, as this kind of thing going on in historical time. Also, of course, Soma, the sacrament of the Vedic civilization, appears to have been a mushroom, was certainly a psychedelic plant. And it isn't only psychedelic plants, it's all plants which affect and shift consciousness. I mean, a history of the human race could be written analyzing it not in terms of class struggle or the impact of great personalities, but as a shifting set of interactions between sugar, tobacco, opium, caffeine, uh, alcohol, and psychedelics. So that, you know, we need to understand that chocolate, <laughs> that these food, cocaine, that these foods and drugs and spices are, uh, we have subtly overlooked them and taken them for granted. They are regulating human history and individual self-expression, how much you know, how you look, 
how uh, pure your transmission of your genetic heritage to the next generation. All of these things are being regulated and controlled by these plants in this way. Now, if we could create a civilization or even a, even a, a clique within a civilization that understood this and had its fingers on a vertical monopoly of research from the jungle to the clinical hospital, uh, great things could be understood. Uh, this is the way to do it, to systematically explore these relationships and see that Gaia apparently works through the intercession of catalytic compounds that convey revelation, and revelation is then the factor which has historical impact. The people, the messiahs and the teachers are merely the pipelines for ideas, and the, the metabolic release of these ideas in the macro environment is being controlled by the plant-animal interaction. And so it will be on into the foreseeable future. And by understanding this, a kind of new science looms into view, a kind of integrated dynamical understanding of uh, the flux of energy mediated by chemistry in the environment so that the, the guiding image of culture can be the revitalized and realized uh, in a much shorter period of time. And this whole shortening period of time thing has also been going on for a while. You see, it isn't astonishing, I think, that self-reflection could emerge giving basic, given basic primate organization. But what is astonishing about it is the speed with which it happened. I mean, in the last 30 to 50,000 years, the human brain has changed more than it changed in the previous 3 to 5 million years. So, you know, a factor has entered, a catalyst is in the mix, and it must be something in the food chain or something in the environment or the hand of Almighty God, or the extraterrestrials, or, you know, elf invasion from hyperspace, that something is causing this accelerated development. And I, and this, it, what I've said this morning could be criticized as being reductionist. I've tried to give a very sober account of it. I haven't said why the mushroom appeared in the manure or discussed whether it has awareness or a stake in the catalyzing of this primate evolution. I just introduce it as a chemical factor, and that's how it would be written if it were presented to a straight audience. The, the fact of the matter is that it raises all kinds of questions. I mean, why is this process being catalyzed in the primates? Is it just uh, by happenstance? Where has the mushroom been? Is it, uh, what is its relationship to the evolution of other forms of life on this planet? Did it drift in from the stars? If so, long ago or recently? And with intent or by chance? And, uh, you know, just a host of questions. But the thing that puts us in such an existential situation, individually and culturally, is this puzzlement over our origins. We are not, strictly speaking, religious in the 19th century way, so that we cannot really, I think, accept that, you know, God sculpted us from clay and set us down here on a world he created, and yet... If you were to look for the thumbprint of God on this planet, you would certainly have to focus in on the, the human beings and their activities as a special case of natural phenomena, perhaps so special a case that it had to be accorded a, a separate ontological status. We are different, and uh, why and for what? Um, I think that probably we are the uh, agent of change 
that Gaia has unleashed upon herself, that the planet itself is aware of the finiteness of planetary existence. And it's sort of like the story of the ant and the grasshopper. You can have a planetary consciousness which says, well, I look forward to three to five billion years of sentient existence, and then I'm willing to be extinguished with the death of my star. Or you can have a plant with an ant, a planet with an ant-like mentality that says, you know, I can sense winter coming three to five billion years down the line, and I'm going to organize some wild strategy to break through the tyranny of the energy cycle of one star, and I'm going to organize biological existence so that energy can be brought, greater and greater amounts of energy can be brought under control so that eventually a kind of liberation can occur where life can burst out of the planetary cradle and disperse itself through the universe. And there are apparently several strategies for this. One is evolve intelligence and build starships. Another is, you know, become a mushroom and produce three to five million spores per minute during sporulation that are particles small enough to percolate by Brownian movement away from the atmosphere of a given planet. And by sheer numbers uh, and the slow gradient of drift by light pressure and that sort of thing emanate through the universe and uh, establish yourself in any planetary regime that is uh, suitable. The, the obvious next great revelation in biology, and it's strange that we can state it, because once it's stated by Carl Sagan, it will be headlines everywhere. But it's obvious that space is no barrier to life. It's a, it's a, it's a barrier in the same way that the Pacific Ocean it was a barrier to life's colonization of the Hawaiian Islands. But that's all. It's just a tight filter, but spores and starships and shamans probably get through to other uh, closed topologies in orbit around other stars. You know, there must be a dimension somewhere where all surfaces in the universe are contiguous. And if you could move into that dimension, you could just walk to Zeta Reticuli. <laughs> So uh, the means by which life will penetrate these larger dimensions that free it from uh, its dependency on the energy cycles of the material universe are not by any means clear. I mean, it may be that it's about organizing the mind and building an inner vehicle that moves off into the imagination. The imagination may be, in fact, a three-dimensional slice of a higher dimensional universe that is holding all of this uh, in being and causing it to happen. The imagination, it's hard to account for it in evolutionary terms if it is not uh, somehow mapping a uh, field of data that is important for development.